So, Lord, even as we transition into a time of impartation of word, we thank you as well that signs and wonders always accompany the word you said. So thank you, Lord, that we're not just following some set pattern, but, Lord, we believe that even today you've prepared the soil of our hearts. You've opened things up. Now, Lord, let the word go in. In Jesus' name. And we also pray, Lord, for also an immediate harvest. Lord, we know that some sow, some water, but you bring the increase. But we're asking in this season for a big increase. In so many ways, that revelation of your word would go in, sprout, bring joy. That we would be like those people in the parable, the man who found a pearl of great price. And for joy, what he'd found was willing to sell everything to get you, knowing that he gained everything. Let that be our hearts, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Adrian. Can we give praise and worship a hand? They were awesome. Just thinking. Uh, for all of you that are bilingual, uh, does avec mean with? Ah, because I was I was thinking of uh, man, what kind of a title do I give this message? I've been thinking with, and I used to. Uh, any of you that ever watched? Uh, no, no, Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. It's like I just love the dumb humor. So they've got the one guy, I don't know what his name is, but he's walking around and he's speaking French and he's walking around and he goes, avec, like this, as if it's supposed to mean something. But it means with. So the title of this message is avec or with. Say with. So we've been, I think it's really good, really, really good if you can go back and listen to the message from, from last week. Yeah, there is... My goodness, there is something in that. Um, let's say this together. There is nothing impossible for the Lord. I believe that there's a, there's a life on that revelation, and it's going to mess you up and stir you up because you've already heard it a thousand times. But when God whispers and it becomes revelation, it changes everything. So um, Genesis 18, the Lord showed up, and it was pretty powerful as he did it. And he comes to Abraham and he says, is anything too hard for the Lord? But you notice that he didn't come to Abraham and say, is anything too hard for you? I mean, if the Lord came to me and said that, is there anything too hard for you? I would go, yeah. Sheesh, usually getting out of bed. It's a challenge just going about your day. I want to address something uh, today. And man, I pray that revelation goes in because it is time for a, a shift of your understanding or faith. And usually it's the simple ones that go in the deepest. So that, that needs to happen over the church as well. I mean, it's time for us to place your expectancy on Jesus. And that sounds like a pretty wide um, phrase, but I want to tell you that it's not. Um, Mark 9, and I'll have Rachel put it up in just a moment. There's this really awkward account, and it kind of leaves this awkward feeling because there's this boy who's got a demon in him, and he, oh, good, confirmation. He's, this demon inside this boy's been there for a long time, and the dad doesn't know what to do. So this demon in this boy would take the boy, throw him into the fire, and he would convulse, and he would always try and take the boy's life which always made me wonder, boy, I wonder what the calling on that young man was. But regardless of that, the disciples are around, and so the dad doesn't know what to do because he cares about his boy big time. And so he goes to the disciples, and he asks the disciples who were in training to cast this thing out, and they couldn't. And so here's the deal. He goes to Jesus. This is a dad who cares about his son. He's in panic mode. And he's going all over the place. He goes to the disciples who are just men. He's probably been to a lot of people who are just men. And they can't do anything. And he goes to Jesus. And he's got like, here's the thing. He, he thinks Jesus is like a man. 
He's been going to men, going to men, going to men. And so he goes up to Jesus and he says this, if you can do anything, please do something. And Rachel, can you put that up there? And that's where Jesus says this. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And you read that and you go, oh, it's awkward. Well, I guess, you know, Jesus just laid the spank down on this guy. And he couldn't believe enough. Boy, I don't want to be like that person. That's awkward. And then you never step out and you never do anything. Because of that one awkward moment. And that's not how that moment went. Listen to this. This is what it actually means. So just did a quick look. Uh, on the actual meaning in that scripture. If you can believe all things are possible to him who believes means this. Believe to have faith in or upon a person. Or more specifically, it meant this. To entrust one's being to Christ. This is what believe means. Not you. I, boy, get this. Believe does not mean, boy, I sure hope that you got enough stuff. I sure hope that you're godly enough. Boy, I sure hope that you've had enough training in you. Boy, I sure hope that you read the Bible enough. Boy, I sure hope that you, just you, can heal that person. All things are possible to those who entrust their well-being to Jesus. Do you hear me? All things are possible for you who trusts Jesus. Say this, I trust Jesus. I want to remove from us today false pressure, which is why we do not step out in the joy of your salvation. Now, Rachel, do you have three scriptures up there? I asked you to put them together. Now, I want you to see this. Luke 1 says this, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Matthew 19 says this, Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Luke 18 says, and he said, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Say avec. Say avec. Look at this. This not, Not one of these scriptures say this. On your own, without God, completely void, you can do anything. With, oh my goodness, people, why do we put so much pressure that you're the healer? Why do we put so much pressure that you're the one who has to step out, you have to do this, when he's the one who's come along and said this, I'm never going to leave you, I'm never going to forsake you, I'll be closer than a brother, I'll be closer than your even next breath. I will be with you. Why do I put so much pressure on myself if I'm going to go pray for someone thinking that I got to have the goods? Say it back. He's with you. Why not put the pressure on him? I don't got to do this. My salvation is not dependent on me and what I've done. That even removes the cross. Oh, how the devil loves to twist this. The moment you think you should step out and up he comes and says, you can't. Don't you remember? You got nothing. You ain't got nothing. I don't need anything. For with God, all things are possible. Man, it, look at what Jesus said. I don't, I, I don't even do this anymore. It's not me. I only do what I see the Father doing. Why do we as Christians do this? You put so much pressure on ourselves as if you've got to do this. You've got to stir up something. God's awful mighty. Amen? Say with. Or you can say avec. It doesn't matter. Avec. Let's go to more awkward. Let's go to John 14. Say awkward. Say it's okay. Because there's revelation in it. 14. Now, I read these things in those moments, and I go, I kind of cringe. Like, the cringe moments, like, oh, <laughs> that is so bad. Because I've done it, so I can do that. Like, you guys have never done it. Yeah, a bunch of halos in here. Pants on fire, that's what I say. Okay, John 14. And uh, uh, here's what Philip 
says, because here's Jesus. He's talking about the Father. And he's saying, man, from now on, you've seen the Father. And so Philip steps up in verse 8, and he says this, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And that's probably exactly what I would do in, in a moment of zeal. Like, this is so awesome. This is so cool. Jesus is talking about the Father. And so Philip goes, just show us the Father. And so Jesus says this, have I been with you for so long, and yet you've not known me, Philip? Awkward. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And then he says this, so how can you say, show us the Father? Oh, awkward moment. But listen to this. Verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the works, sorry, the words that I speak to you, I don't speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me and does the work. He's not talking of some sort of metaphor. He's not doing some sort of simile. This is a real deal. Say real. Jesus is saying this, the Father is in me. This is real. I'm in the Father. This is, this is a real thing. He says this in verse 11. Believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. This is, this is real. He's in me. Man, that's the whole thing of, of salvation. The birth, the brand new born again Christian. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, verse 12, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now look at verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, that who will do? Why do we put so much pressure on ourselves that if we say you've got to step out and pray for someone, all of a sudden the first thing that comes is some sort of fear. What if it doesn't work? What if all this kind of stuff? And here's Jesus saying this. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Why are you putting pressure on yourself? Come to me, all of you who labor. Let me show you the unforced rhythms of grace in your life. Why do you pressure yourself, putting a spotlight on yourself? I'll do it. Work with me. Surrender to me. Learn the way that I move. Learn the way that I flow. Let me do it in you. Amen? Why do we pressure ourselves like this? It is the greatest gift and revelation to know that Jesus is on the inside. It is one of the wildest things to know that you can actually walk with the Savior, that he can talk to you, that as you move about and have your being, there he is speaking to you and leading you and drawing you into, yes, situations sometimes that you don't want to be in. Hey, go. No, 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 go pray for that person. Okay. And then when you go, you don't have to be concerned. It's Christ in you. And the thing that you ask, he says this, I'll do it. Moving on. That the Father would be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, he says it again. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Not, not, not you, but yes, Christ in you, the partnership. Oh, yes. But the pressure is not on you. Amen? Moving on. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. He is like the nuclear, super, holy ghost, power, crazy. It's not enough that God will do it, but I'm going to give you completely holy power, nuclear bomb, holy ghost. And look at this. He'll abide with you forever. Look, another of Verse 17. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be where? In you. Say a vac. Oh, my goodness. 
we lead our lives thinking that somehow Jesus is separate until those one moments when we call on him and pray. And yet he's in you and with you, always knocking, always asking, always ready. It's not a hindrance. It's not a perv that he pries in. These are all unsaid weird things that go on. He created you, knows you, knows your substance, knows your thoughts from afar. Why would we think that he's far away? And then all of a sudden, if he calls you to do something, which he calls all of us to do, that somehow he backs off. He's with you. And when you ask, he will do it. Amen? I tell you that we are coming into a season of such simplicity in Christ that if you're trying to figure it out, it's not going to go well. And if you think you have to figure it out, it's not going to go well. And if you think that you got it all figured out, it's not going to go well. But for the simple and for those who will trust him at his word, you are going to see things that you've never seen before. Amen? Say with. I tell you what, I don't want the pressure. And he's never put that on me. That's the job of an enemy. That's called actually the strategy of pressure to wear you out to put so much pressure and anxiousness just on you that you can hardly function. And men will hide themselves in caves as times press on for fear or anxiousness that's coming on the earth. What is that? That's the strategy of pressure to squish you and squeeze you and make you think that it's all on you. And scripture completely denies that. It's all on Jesus. Everything I've already done for you and given you exceedingly great and precious promises, step into them with me. Amen? I don't want to do this alone. Who would? But with God, whoa, all things are possible. Amen. I'm going to read something to you. This is so cool. I've just been reading the uh, uh, true stories of the miracles of Azusa Street and beyond. And uh, there's this guy, his name's Tommy Welchel. And it's super interesting because this guy's ministry was to sit at the people, sit at the feet of the people of Azusa Street and just write down their stories. This is what he was called to do. And they all knew that it was him. So he, he interviewed them when they were young. Uh, sorry, when they were, they were young at Azusa Street, so he interviews them in their 90s, much farther after, and they would tell their stories to him. I've just been stirred by the simplicity that these people operated in. Not one of them was a scholar, not one. But they stepped out in simplicity for three and a half years. They walked, they saw all the miracles of God, just like the disciples. For three and a half years, Jesus walks with these guys and says, look how I do it. Learn the rhythm of unforced grace. See how I do these things. And then he released them. And for three and a half years in Azusa, there's miracles after miracles after miracles. They watched how Jesus did it. And then everyone went, Azusa stopped. It must have been a guy's fault. No. We are people of nature. We would stay right there instead of take it everywhere else. Just like when Pete was up with Jesus and he was manifest. And Pete was like, I mean, I probably would have done the same thing. This is so cool. Let's stay here. Let's just stay here. And Jesus says, no, we've got to go back down. There's a demon at the bottom of the hill. Let's go. You take what you've seen here because it will change you and transform you. That's what light does. And it pushes out darkness. And now that darkness has been pushed out to you, what's darkness? Fear, doubt, unbelief, pressure, strategy of anxiousness to take you out. Light dispels that. Light just brings simple revelation of this. Oh, my goodness, he's with me. When I step out, he's with me. I don't have to have all this pressure on me. In fact, I'm coming out from underneath that thing. I'm not a victim of pressure. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm with him. What is he going to do today? Someone who has that simple revelation will not be overcome.
Okay, I'm going to read to you a little bit. So this was very cool. I, I liked, I mean, this was 100 years ago, roughly, and they would address each other and uh, call each other like brother or sister, this or that. So here's just one, one story. It says, the next story surprised me even more. I still marvel when I think of it. One day, Sister Dundee found a horribly disfigured child around five years old among the people of Azusa Street. He had scars all around his head. The family said that the doctor literally had to piece his face back together after he fell from a staircase onto a concrete floor when he was about two and a half years old. The side of his face took the impact and it was about one quarter of an inch lower than the rest of his head. Sister Dundee could tell he wasn't uh, normal mentally either. And her reaction was this, oh, how marvelous. God gets glory when things like this happen. And the father said, like what things? And she said this, he's going to be healed. See, by this time, they didn't say God will. They said he is healed. And do you know when I read that, I go, whoa. Do you know how they said that? They had been with God. And this part of the story that they're getting to, they're almost at the end of the three years. And this lady has been for three years in God's presence, with him, with him, with him, with him, with him. And she found out this, that with God, nothing is impossible. And I followed their stories. The more the, more the miracles pressed on, the more simple the people became. And there became this expectancy that with God, he'll just do it. With yourself, who knows? But with God, nothing's impossible. Amen? Let pressure be taken. I address you pressure right now. You lying thing that you think that you can trick the people of God that it's all on them. The Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. You have been defeated by the cross of Christ. And even right now, our dependency is on you. Get off of the people of God. In Jesus' name. Liar. Here we go. They had so much confidence that God was going to heal everyone and everything. Let me hold the boy in my lap, she said, as she set him down and laid her hands on his head. Sister Dundee could tell and see and feel that her hands were moving and shifting as she was praying. Finally, she took her hands away. That's the mercy of God with him. Finally, she took her hands away, and the boy's face was perfectly normal. He was healed mentally as well. Now, here's the shocker. The disfigured child grew up to be a handsome Hollywood star. His name was Robert Montgomery. He became an actor on stage, on screen, as well as a director. He was an Academy Award winner, Tony Award winner, and all the other award winners. He was in um, a thriller called Night Must Fall. His daughter, Elizabeth Montgomery, starred in the hit show Bewitched in the 1960s. From grotesque disfigurement to a golden boy in Hollywood. How's that for a miracle? Woo! There is nothing that is impossible with God. And if i got to say this a whole bunch of times, I'm going to say it again. There is nothing impossible with God. So if the shift in your season is just this, I'm going to stop trying to do everything myself and just seriously give this to the Lord and walk with him and see his miracles. I tell you, you will become more and more childlike, and there's this manifestation of something that's going to happen in your life, and it's called this, joy. Joy does not come from all the pressure on you. Joy always comes from the presence of the Lord. And the cool thing was this, every time, and I've been in meetings like this, but every time I read this here, so someone would get healed and, and like messed up people, messed up disfigurement, uh, things would grow, arms would grow, every, all this stuff would happen. 
when people, especially in wheelchairs, would come, they would open up their wheelchairs from them, and they would pray over them. And the reaction of everyone that I read here was all the same. The moment they got healed, joy overtook them. And they got up, and they started to dance, and they started to twirl like this. And the people that were praying for them also got overtaken by joy. And so you had all these people running around and dancing in joy. True joy comes from walking with Jesus. There's no pressure when you're walking with Jesus. And I find this interesting, too. I think it's in Romans 16. It says this. Say first, first say shalom. Okay. It's the God of peace who's going to crush Satan underneath your feet, Romans 16. And what's really interesting, because it could say this, the God of war, uh, the God who kicks butt, or the God of manifestations, or the God of anything, but it's this. The God of peace is going to whoop Satan underneath your feet shortly. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So do not give up your personal time of worship. Amen? My goodness. Just do the shift. Do the shift. Last thing I'm going to show you as well. I think... Can you say meek? Meek in our meek in our culture means that you're going to get whooped. Meek in our culture means that you're going to get run over. Someone's going to take advantage of you. No one likes that. And in fact, if you dwell too much on that, you can you can remember the times when that's happened to you. Someone's run you over. Someone's crushed you or publicly done this to you. And then what happens in you is this whole thing of self-defense. I'm not going to let that happen again. And the enemy rejoices over that because you guard yourself. I remember Angie and I went to, um, I've said this before, we were on a, when we were running a, a ministry training center, we had to go out on the road and do PR stuff. And so we would go out and I had brochures, I would all stuff, and we were promoting the school. And we were terrible at promoting the school, terrible, but we were really, really good at prophesying and having words of knowledge and all that kind of stuff. So we had, we had uh, churches that were preset. We had to go see them, that kind of stuff. Walked into one, and it was a beautiful church. Like, wow, was it ever well made? And I remember walking in going, whoa, like that. And so the pastor come out, and he was clearly agitated. And, and he, was like, he was treating us like we were doing some sort of hostile takeover. And so I was like, whoa, dude. Here, just brochures. I mean, you can turf them. You do whatever you want to do with them. doesn't matter. That's fine. And I, before we left, I had to say, okay, look, I'll probably never see you again. I just got to tell you this. I, God's shown me something. I've seen this about you. I see you guarding your church like with a shotgun. You, you're, you're standing in front of two double doors, and you won't let anyone in. And he's, he started to say something to the acknowledgement of he got really hurt there was a church split, and he's not going to allow that to happen again. And he's very firm in that, like this. And I spoke to him, and I said, out of respect, out of as much respect as I could give him, and gentle. And I told him this, the very thing that you think that you're doing to protect the people is the very thing that is hurting them. You will not also allow the Spirit of the Lord in here. You've protected so much that no one can come in, not even God. But I'm telling you now that if you would soften yourself and work with the Lord and allow him, he'll revive this whole place. And then out of as much gentleness and respect as we could, we also left that place. And he was, he was to the place where he was like, all of his hostility moved and he, sh he went, He wasn't hurt. We didn't offend him or do anything. But the Lord had spoken to him in a spirit of gentleness. Praise the Lord. I am not pushing you into a new season. I'm not telling you that you have to go into a new season. I'm saying whether I like it or not, we're all going into a new season. And it's going to be a phenomenal good season. Amen? On your own may be difficult. With the Lord, 
nothing's impossible. I didn't give this to you, Rachel, but let's go to Luke 10. And I'll put my glasses on so that it's actually Luke 10. This is super awesome. Now, I really like the ministry of Pete, John, and Jim. I, I really like these guys because they were messed up, and Jesus said, I'm going to use you guys anyway, especially Pete. Pete's messed up, and he, he always says the wrong thing, and he's impulsive, and he's all of that stuff. I love that guy. And Jesus saw something in those guys, uh, just a humility or a realness or whatever it was that he can use them. But if you read the scriptures too much, you can see that um, and look at it incorrectly, you can see oh, it was always just Pete, John, and Jim. It was just those guys. Look at Luke 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also. Well, also to who? Pete, John, and Jim. And he sent them out two by two before his face to every city and place where he was about to go himself. So if you think that it's about some people, these people will do this. No, 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 no. And Jesus sent them all out. I'm not going to send you out alone. I'll send you out in two. You'll be with somebody else, but you will totally be with me. It's not just about the three. And we'll do a, we'll do a bigger teaching on Luke 10 later on, but I want to show you something. If I can find it. There we go. Wasn't that far away at all. Verse 2. What are you laughing at? Okay. He says to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Now look at verse 3. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And you can read it like this. They are going to get spanked. Oh, that's going to be ugly. He's sending them out, and these wolves, these ravenous wolves, are going to chew them up. Why would you do that, Jesus? That's not what he's doing. Here's what he's doing. The whole lambs thing, this is what it means. Like children, but more so like this, meek and gentle. Here's what I'm doing, especially in this last day, is I work with you. Is he acknowledging that there's wolves out? Come on, you know he is. Saying it's kind of rough out there. But here's how I'm going to send you out. Not with a spear, not with boxing gloves. I'm not sending you out to take my word to whack it on people and drive them away. Here's how I'm going to send you out. Gentle. In a spirit of gentleness. This time that we're going into where you see the opposite happening all over the place. Oh, my goodness. You want to get angry? Look at gas prices. Who's responsible? Ooh, someone's going to pay. I'm sending you out like this, like lambs, in a spirit of gentleness. And they're going to know that something's so different about you. But you don't have to worry because I'm with you. And wherever I go, you're going with me. I'm sending you out gentle. And if you cannot be gentle, do not go until you have a revelation. Say meek. Matthew 5, Jesus is prophesying and telling all about the people. And he says, the same thing in Psalm 37, I believe. He says this, there is a people who are going to inherit the whole earth. And they have a name that's printed on them. And they are called this, meek. What does that mean? Weak? No, gentle. Gentle. Say gentle. Amen. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. Lord, I, I first, I, I pray revelation to come. You, you have never, ever left us. You have never, ever forsaken us. And you won't leave now. Father, I pray that a revelation right now of with would become so simple 
that the roots would go in so deep that we would never, Father, we would even laugh. When fear and anxiousness comes and says, you can't do this, they would, Lord, you laugh. You laugh at the nations. When they're doing wicked things, your word says you laugh at them. God, I pray that we would become a people who would laugh. When the serpent comes, when pressure comes, when fear comes, when anxiousness comes, we would be a people that laugh on the inside because we're not doing this alone. We are with you. In fact, God, your word says that we are seated in heavenly places with in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that we would not be a people that are taken out by any kind of a depression or a fear, but that simplicity would come about your people in Jesus' mighty name. In fact, I'm going to do something today. If you would like that revelation of simplicity, would you just stand up like a little kid would and just please stand? And if you need to put your hand up, that's just fine. I don't want to be stuck in complication and God's word is a light to my path. He always sets me free. That's what his word does. But let it go into you in simplicity and in truth. So, Father, I pray right now, Lord, where there's been complication or a twisting of the enemy, where the word has gotten twisted or where the calling of God has gotten twisted in Jesus' mighty name, I thank you even this morning that you make the crooked places straight. And so in each person here today, Lord, I thank you for straightening out a path that the pressure of the scriptures and of the word are not on us alone. But the partnership of walking this life with you and learning the unforced rhythms of grace, Lord, nothing is impossible with you. Nothing is impossible with you. Thank you, Lord. Just stay there. I was still reading. I was reading Mark 9 during um, worship, and it was really interesting, and it's exactly what the message is doing. And is Mark 9.23 says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the verse right after that, verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Then there's this little, I'm going to give you, this is what happens. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of new life, victory, fellowship, and enter here no more. Then the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of new life, victory. And so I prayed that in the beginning uh, while we were having worship because I didn't know and I never know what Darren is going to speak. And I know that if the Lord wants those words said, that he'll highlight it. And so the Lord is highlighting that he wants to deliver us from unbelief. He wants us to believe the word that we heard today, that all things are possible. And the truth is, is every one of us have some measure of unbelief in some area. And that's okay. When you can see it, God is showing you, and that's when he's going to deliver you from it. So if you have felt that you have unbelief and it's hard for you to believe that God is with you, then I just want you to put your hand up. We're going to acknowledge it before the Lord, just starting with mine. And as your hand goes up, Jesus sees that, and he is going to deliver you. And I want you to say this same thing. Say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I don't want it anymore. I want to believe you. I want to be a believer that you are with me always. Okay, just stay there. So, Father, I thank you for your anointing of delivering us. I thank you, Lord, that today unbelief has been removed from this congregation in Jesus' name. If they came in with it, they're not going out with it. And we address unbelief in every deaf and dumb spirit right now. And we command you in the authority of the name of Jesus, come off this people. Never to return. And we welcome 
the anointing to believe, Lord, come now. Just say with me, say, come, Jesus, fill me up in all the places that unbelief has been. Light me up, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus said to them, uh, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. Listen, the Lord working with them. Confirming the word through the accompanying signs and wonders. If you read it incorrectly, it says, wonderful time, and they went out and they did it by themselves. No. When the revelation happened, the Lord worked with them. And the accompanying signs and wonders. Amen. Lord, thank you for a people, a very strong, a very awesome people. Thank you that with you, nothing's impossible. Now, Lord, I'm also going to thank you now, not later, but now, for the accompanying signs and wonders as you work with us. Here's what we're going to do, people. You ain't just walking out. You're sitting beside people. You're sitting behind or in front of people. So this is what we're going to do before you leave. I want you just to turn and find someone and just simply say this. How can we pray for you? Not, not just me. How can we? It's like Christ in you. Just say, how can we pray for you? And then listen, the pressure is not on you. In fact, let's say this together. Say, Father, the pressure is not on me. It's not even here. Good. So we're just going to say this together. How can I pray for you? How can we pray for you? So do that. Please turn, find someone beside you, and just say, how can I pray?